The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews. By students, for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SCP studio, some of the brightest stars of medical education. First, she's adored by so many. It's MD PhD student Riley B. and Bush. Howdy. A megastar in his own right. It's M4 Nathan Spitz. Daddy's here. <laughs> his popularity is only eclipsed by his character. Say hello to M2 Matt Engelkin. Howdy. And a man who's on the cusp of superstardom. It's M2 Zay Edgren. What's up? Welcome to the show, Zay. Thank you. It's good to be here. You've been behind the scenes a few times at this point, but now you're on the show. Let's go, baby. <laughs> hey, special thanks to Sarah, who donated to our show recently. She bought a pin and a sticker from us, and I accidentally sent her two of each. And so she thanked us by donating that and a little extra, and I'm grateful, Sarah, both for your donation and for your words of encouragement that you sent along with it. That was a kind gesture. This is such a good marketing scheme, by the way, Dave. I feel like it's similar to the people who hand out bracelets in bigger <laughs> cities where if I just give you a little something extra, I expect more in I return. See. So I, I see. see what you're doing. Or it's like free puppy day or it's like name your price puppy day where mm. they like huh. at shelters, they'll be like, name your price. And it's like, I mean, I guess like full price. I feel bad. <laughs> a, free will, a, a free will donation. Or if the you will. classic high school move of like, it's free, but you should give us a donation. Yeah. Yeah. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Not a very good businessman. So I need, uh, I need a little help in that regard. Yeah, if you want to make a kind gesture, sh- short coats, you can do that by visiting the shortcoat.com and clicking the donate button. It, it really is nice to know that someone cares enough about what we're doing to give us a little extra scratch and gives us a little extra kick in our steps so we can keep drinking from the fire hose. <laughs> this phrase, you know, th- this uh, phrase, drinking from the fire hose, this is something that I hadn't heard before beginning my work here at the Carver College of Medicine. Did you guys know this phrase before you came to med school? Yes. If people aren't familiar, it's the idea that the information presented to you will come at you so fast. You try to drink from the font of knowledge or the font of the the fire hydrant as fast as you can. One that I relate with more, I guess, now having gone through medical school, is the idea, the idea of pancakes. Mm. Um, I like pancakes. Oh, me too. Flapjacks. Blackberries. <laughs> some yeah. lemon ricotta. Anyway, um, the idea that your know, medical school is going to present to you the same amount of pa- roughly the same amount of pancakes every day and so it's like important for you to eat you know your two pancakes every day and if you eat your two pancakes if you put in your time every day that it stays manageable you know sometimes if you do decide that you're you're full and you don't want to eat some pancakes that's okay it's not your day for pancakes yeah you just will have more pancakes waiting for you later that those pancakes are never you have to eat you, you gotta eat them you gotta eat like them regardless that, there's no there's no throwing the pancakes in the trash or feeding them to your dog i mean you or, could throw the pancakes in the trash but then eventually the trash bag will burst and then you'll have pancakes all over the floor and, and diabetes and <laughs> and, and, and that'll be a huge mess that you have to clean up i feel like that is let's, a much... let's continue to extend this analogy as far as possible i I do question whether pancakes is the correct one because like pancakes are delicious. I feel like we need something slightly less delicious. It's broccoli. It's things that uh, you do really don't want to eat, but you but have it's good to. For you. Yeah, yeah, it's good for you. And then you're going to have like, you know, 10,000 pieces of broccoli if you don't eat your two pieces of broccoli a day at correct. the end of it all. And nobody wants that much fine. broccoli. Brussels sprouts. Are we, is it? I am if pro they Brussels are sprouts. roasted and covered in Parmesan and garlic Chef's and guess. bacon bits. But you can't but. cover lectures in bacon bits and Parmesan <laughs> and uh, garlic. I beg to differ. You could watch those lectures in bed. That Ooh, sounds pretty bacon bitty true. to me. You can turn those lectures on two times speed. <laughs> 
how far can we take this <laughs> although a power move with watching them is just put on some like light classical music in the background so it feels like you're in like a study montage from a like a period movie this yeah is- but you know what happens when you do that you watch it at two times speed you're in your bed you got the music playing in the background maybe a little little show in the background what happens is you end up with five more pancakes because you have to watch it five more times to really get the information to sink in yes i had heard of of drinking from the fire hose (laughs) coming to medical sorry returning to the point i feel like i had also heard about it but only in the context of preparing for medical school like it was one of those things that you heard and you have that image of like when you're a kid and you've got the like hose because you're playing with a sprinkler outside and you try to like drink from it and it just like blasts you in the face and you can't get any water (laughs) and you're like okay i get that yeah you're like i get that and then i don't think it really sunk in until about what three weeks into medical school once you've gone through the first exam and suddenly you realize oh my gosh this is my life for the next you know unknown amount of time and it does start to slowly creep up on you it's almost like the monster that's not like right there at the beginning it's just a it's one of those monsters that's like slowly walking toward you and like no matter how far you run Mm -hmm. like the monster will keep coming and it just felt like you started to get that little twinge of, oh, this is a lot of work. And then suddenly you have an exam and you already have four lectures for the following exam. And you're like, oh, wow, I just want to go home and do nothing. And it's constantly knowing that that monster is following you. It's, it's like that never dream just take a that full we break. all have where like we're running from something and no matter what it is, we're going to trip and fall and it's yes. going to catch up to us. What I'm hearing being reflected in this room is that medical school is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. But it's sometimes it's pancakes. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I just remember at the beginning of my M1 year, kind of having the same experience where I was like, you know, I feel like I'm like, I'm eating my pancakes every day. I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job keeping up with lecture. And then I take the first exam and I'm like, oh, so they want us to know more than I thought that they would. <laughs> yeah. And that just like keeps going. I mean, or, 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 oh, I ate the blueberry pancakes, but it was supposed to be the uh-huh. banana pancakes correct they gave us a pancake bar and there were right or wrong (laughs) answers to the pancakes (laughs) we were supposed to eat (laughs) yeah i and i do remember too as the year progressed and i'm generally talking about the first few like the didactic years i'm in a phd now it's very chill but at the beginning when i did have all the studying to do i remember i never felt like i could take a full break it's almost like eating the pancakes took up the whole day and then by the time i was done eating the pancakes i was so exhausted to think about doing anything Mm -hmm. else that it just kind of felt all consuming and I still reflect to this day on my first semester of medical school or the first couple semesters and I remember getting up to go to the gym like in god forsaken early hours of the morning because I was just so overwhelmed by the amount of information I needed and I knew when I came back after school I wasn't going to want to go to the gym Mm -hmm. so it's waking up at five seemed like the better alternative than trying to like muster the energy after so looking back it's almost like the the drinking from a water hose becomes way more clear and was really detrimental to the life that i wanted outside of medical school i think as something that i like say to younger medical students now is that like it doesn't get easier you just get better like that speed that it's coming out of the hose isn't necessarily going to change but your stomach capacity or those pancakes, your stomach capacity is going to grow. You're going to learn over time how you eat pancakes best. So for Riley, for example, eating pancakes, you know, it might be easier after she's like gone to the gym in the morning or for some people it might be. But, you know, some people like structure it best when they know that they eat five pancakes a lot easier, you know, at once than eating two each day. So I think just like over time, you learn how you study best you learn your schedule best you learn how to approach different subjects best and you become you become stronger yeah i think the adapting is the key because mm-hmm. actually as i reflect it's not in the time that i felt this crazy like i didn't actually have the awareness to realize that i was so overwhelmed it's only in reflecting back and having kind of this like cushy schedule that I have now that I look back and I say oh that was really hard and Mm -hmm. I think in hindsight everything is 2020 or whatever they say but 
in the time like I was adapting and I adapted fairly quickly and it became the lifestyle and I wanted some degree of structure in my day I kind of knew what pieces I needed to do I knew I wanted to try to watch the lectures in the morning because I was more of a morning person I knew I couldn't study past like 8 p.m so I didn't even try and having the realization in that time like it made it so much more manageable and adding those pieces of my life, like working out, like making good dinners for myself, like seeing friends, seeing family, calling my mom, all of that allowed the the fire hose to feel way more manageable. And I know at the time it can feel like I don't want to shove anything else in my schedule, but I think the things that I did that were best for me were actually adding in the things that really brought me joy in that made it so that I was actually able to take on the day and do the things that I needed to do in medical school. Yeah, I know one issue that I've run into and continuously run into is like the idea of like, oh, I just need to get through X and I'll be able to relax or like I just need to like finish this exam or finish this semester or get through like didactics or whatever. And then I can. Sounds like the sort of thing you tell yourself in order to not go crazy yeah but like the thing that we've kind of talked about is like it doesn't stop Mm -hmm. so like although it might be nice to tell yourself in the moment like i'm just gonna grind and get this done with as soon as you're done with that step then you just have to grind for the next thing so i think what riley said about like taking the time in the day to be yourself and like knowing that yeah that is I guess, theoretically detrimental to what you could learn. The amount that you gain from like not just being like a shell of yourself is kind of irreplaceable. And it takes a long time to, I mean, I haven't fully learned it yet. I always want to cram that extra bit. But then like the days where I'm like, no, I should just like stop. Then like no when you reach that limit is something that is like a constant skill that needs to be uh, evolved. And it's really hard. I feel like going with the analogy to me, it feels like hunting for the chocolate chips and the pancake. So like first year I would try to eat this giant pancake, get through half of it and I wouldn't get a single chocolate chip. (laughs) And like, as the year goes on, you get better at finding the chocolate chips. Mm -hmm. And some people in your class will like eat one sixteenth of a pancake and have the exact chocolate chips because they're amazing. But like, I feel like we all just see the improvement over the year versus the fire hose analogy you don't you can't just unhinge your jaw like you never can start you you can't you can't get better at drinking out of a fire hose but that's why i like the pancake analogy so much more amen something that i want to like this is just like stirring in me is the like to bring back that kind of like monster analogy is the like kind of like two sides of the coin of the kind of stockholm syndrome and just kind of like accepting that this is the lifestyle that we live versus like something that i've struggled with all throughout medical school is like the constant like raging against the bar you know rattling of the bars of why the hell is it like this like yeah like no seriously like i continue i like continue to feel this like tension and this like fear that I'm like settling into this like expectation that this is like all consuming or that this is and I know that there are I try my best at times to like incorporate things that like help me still feel like a whole person did that like monster analogy start before clinicals or after clinicals for you oh no it's sort of like the like <laughs> oh, week two I it was like week two when I was like what the hell am I doing like <laughs> I don't And I think it was probably worse in the preclinicals for me because so much time was spent like studying or staring at a laptop, like doing things that I like, you know, most people don't apply to medical school to like study or take tests. Maybe some people do. Uh, maybe some people do and if you do if, if you're, you're, if you're, you're in the right place yeah if you're interested in, in coming to medical school just for the studying we want to yep. hear from you yeah yeah we'll send have us you a we'll have you on the show because we'll have questions for you <laughs> and I think the monster has changed too like in uh, now looking at my or now it's like fine because I'm in my fourth year but especially during core year or rotation years the monster was like inflexibility and like lack of control over my schedule i just like constantly was like fighting against that feeling like upset angry like why are they not giving us our schedules until the literal day that we get there why are they so inflexible that we like can't take breaks or have a normal like vacation like other professions and i think for me it was like comparison I was like constantly like looking at my friends outside of medical school and I was like envious and jealous 
of like the flexibility that they had, the time off that they had. And it was really like battling, I think, like with myself and like I could, you know, there's always like the opportunity to like hop off. Like I can always stop. I can always quit. And there isn't no knowing the reasons for why it's like this, why it's so regimented, why, why it's so rigid does nothing no. <laughs> to make you feel better. I mean, knowing that we have to, you know, there is a curriculum that we are required to get through for reasons as close to being by law as there could be. It, d- it does nothing to, to make you feel like, oh, okay, I get it. I feel better now. Uh, <laughs> I feel thank like, you, med school. May I have another? <laughs> I feel like, I mean, obviously I don't know much as much as like some of the older students, but I feel like a lot of times when you ask that question and you're like, well, why are we doing this? And it's like, well, because I said so. <laughs> it's like, that's not like, like maybe your patient's going to need to know it or the classic, like in foundations, they'd be like, well, maybe you'll get pimped. And I'm like, I don't care about getting pimped. I want to know why I'll need this as a doctor. Oh, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Just you wait. Yeah. And so like, that's really like tricky, especially being in a place that like doesn't have as much power as like an attending or a professor and being like, okay, so why do we need to learn this? And like, why are you teaching it in the way that you're teaching it? And like, why are you doing those things? And like, we don't have the answers yet. Will we ever have the answer? I don't I, know. I but. really don't. I mean, I know this might be an un- unpopular opinion among med students, but I really don't think it's because people want to torture you. <laughs> right. I, I think the reason is because we and by we, I mean your attendings and your and your and, and your curriculum people and your course directors. We have you for a limited amount of time, and we have to get you ready for being an intern, which is a lot of work and and a certain amount of responsibility. And um, you know that's our that that is our. Our biggest fear is you leaving here and not having what you need. I have also heard people say, you know, we, we, if we're too nice to you, then you won't be prepared for what it's like in the real world. I don't know how I feel about that. That's called breaking a person down just so they build up stronger. And I, disagree wholeheartedly I, I don't want to say that this is a common refrain in medical education but but there is a certain amount of well we had to do it so mm-hmm. you know you have to do it too but i think it's also just you know an acknowledgement that when you get out there people are not going to hold your hand right you're going to be expected to figure it out and that's painful and you got to be prepared for it and if you're not prepared for it then you're going to struggle even more if the expectation is that you're going to go out there and get destroyed and you get taught that, you know, the real world's going to be really hard. And like, I'm not saying that it isn't, but I'm saying like the expectation is that it's going to be really hard. And the expectation is that your attendings are going to like, like rip into you. And when you're a doctor, like you're not going to have any help. And so maybe like there is a part of the world where that comes true just because that's the expectation that's been set forever instead of being like, hey, maybe we should like help people rather than trying to like Riley said break them down and then build them back up well it's an oxymoron to say medicine is a team like it's a team thing like we are working together to better a patient and yet at the same time say that we must break the individual to build them back up and like there's something about that that I agree that like you have to get the individual ready for the real world especially when you have a cohort of people that are generally coming straight from undergrad may not have had the experience in life to have those people that when you walk into a meeting you're going to get yelled at and you have to turn around and take that information and get something useful for it at the same time building up the individual just to assume that like these people are then going to berate them feels antithetical to like the goal of medicine which is to like work as a team sure maybe just maybe some people don't care about the team maybe they just want the individual i think nathan as the m4 in the room how often have you experienced the super negative stuff that we're talking about right now yeah no i feel like very fortunate and I, you know, want to acknowledge like my, you know, privilege as like a white cis male person that nobody's really like negatively berated me. How often have you been of, like yelled at? I mean, yeah, often, like almost never. Yeah. Um, I, I think that most people, I think that most people have your, 
your best interests right. Pe- at heart. People will like correct you or like uh, provide, you know, opportunities for you to like grow. And, or learn. and, it, sometimes, and sometimes it curt. feels bad. Yeah. Sometimes it's like really curt and short. Like, for example, I think surgeons often get a really like negative stereotype of being short, curt, mean, rude, etc. And then like coming into the clerkship, I was like, why is it all, you know, why is it always surgeons that like get this rap that they're mean, rude to students, like belittle them, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> went through clerkships and I'm like oh because they're doing 24 hour shifts because they're on call because they're like literally dealing with like life and death situations and they and don't like, have time they don't they to... literally don't have time for I mean a... hopefully what they have time for is to be constructive right but that doesn't mean that they can't be like no 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 you got to do this yeah and I... and yeah that kind of feels nasty in certain situations but you got I I think probably you have to just like take a deep breath and be like okay Short Coats, we love to hear from you, no matter what it's about. So call us at 347-SHORT-CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. Our sponsor this week is the Professional and Graduate School Virtual Conference from us at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. Join us on Thursday, October 6th at 2 p.m., as we showcase careers in healthcare, education, and biomedical research. This exciting event is being hosted via Zoom, and we'll have breakout rooms to explore our biomedical science, PhD programs, our Doctor of Medicine, MD program, and our Physician Assistant, MPAS degree programs. Register at theshortcoat.com slash careers. Back to the podcast. I I think we can give the, like, drinking from a fire hose or eating all the pancakes, we can give all those analogies a lot of flack, Personally, I think it's the thing that has made me grow the most over the last four years. It's the one of the harder kind of academic pursuits I've had to go through. Yet I do look back and I say I am probably better for it. And as long as those people are not being malicious, as we've just talked about, we don't want the breaking down to build back up. We want mentors. We want the people that explain, hey, we may come off as brass, curt, whatever it may be, but this is for the betterment of your your education. This is the betterment of the the patients. I think that can be an effective strategy. And I do think in some ways... remembering that? What was that? What can be an an effective strategy? I think the... The toughness, like the the difficulty of medical school, the difficulty of preclinicals, the difficulty of clinicals really does harbor the person's ability not only to become a better doctor, but to just become a more resilient human. And I do feel more resilient because of that. Yeah, I think this I think the the part that people like me worry about is that that process of making people people like shouldn't have to become resilient i guess is like how i'm like i I mean that's yeah like part of me pushes back a little bit on that idea because it it implies that you know if you don't if you don't make it that means something was wrong with you and i i don't know that that i don't think that's what you or any of us mean you know like it's it's not it's it just means that you know, I, I don't know. You can't win them all. You, you, you know, maybe you'd be happier doing something else. Um, yeah, I'm I not think, sure I'm expressing that. No, well. I mean, we like continue to ask, like, why does it have to be like this? And I think in essence, it's just like due to like staff shortage and like f- money put in. Like if there were enough physicians or providers to cover a hospital equitably, like we wouldn't have to have physicians doing 24 hour shifts plus four hours after of like no writing. We wouldn't have to have you know surgeons doing marathon surgeries and then call afterwards and like we wouldn't have to build this like resilience like what Riley was talking about like people shouldn't I don't think and as we like continue to face the f- epidemic pandemic however you want to describe it of like physician suicide or resident suicide or medical student suicide like if we do take it it's so easy to just it's money but like honestly if I mean we, it is it's money if we had an, enough funds to pay so that doctors or residents or whoever like didn't have to work that much to, because hospitals like or the government system whatever like won't bring on more people to give support like i yeah. don't think we have to push people so hard to create or try to artificially like manifest 
resilience in somebody else. I'd still argue, though, <clears throat> that there needs to be some level of pushing. And I do agree that the the epidemic of physician and medical student and resident suicide is is terrible. And that is showing that people are being pushed too much. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I think going through this process to not become even slightly more resilient by the end point would be in some ways a tragedy. And I think ultimately that is just kind of what learning and growing in any job brings is the, and I, and I don't mean resilience in a bad connotation because the way I'm meaning it is within my boundaries. Like I want boundaries and I want to yes. be resilient in those. Mm-hmm. That is a- Resilience is not being pushed past your boundary. If you're pushed past your boundary, that is, that is not what I'm talking about. I, that is incorrect. And yeah, so what I'm like, saying I've, is I've, differentiating like compliance versus like perseverance. We're like, we want to be able to persevere. We want to be able to like, like you said, like be resilient with her and our boundaries. But the second we like become like complacent is like, we don't want to get there. We don't want to get to the point where, and like, it's hard to see, you know, doctors get there and be like, oh shoot, am I going to be like 40 and like hating my life? It's kind of like a scary thought to have as someone that isn't there yet. And so how do we get to like the point where, like you said, we need it's the point where resiliency. you go to work and you go to work for a reasonable number of hours. You have reasonable work conditions. And after you and you work and you are hard in that time, because ultimately being a doctor is still going to be difficult. You're still going to have patients that do not have the best outcomes. You're still going to have problems to solve during the day. That's the resilience we want to build is that you can see a patient that is dying and know I am able to help them in some way. The resilience we don't want though is, Hey, you worked an eight hour shift, actually have to work a 12 hour shift and you're not going to get paid for it. Or, Hey, you worked 60 hours a week during this residency. Well, actually you got to work like another 40 and that's like, we're going to keep it on the hush hush. Like we want the resiliency for the job. We don't want it outside of the job. You want to work your hours. You want to go home and you want to have a life outside. Well, okay. Let's, do this then for the last bit on this topic what how do how do you how are you going to set those boundaries how are you going to set and maintain those boundaries as you proceed through this i mean it's hard to know what boundaries you can set or what that even means before you've done it yeah i mean it's a good point i think the boundaries i can speak on are the ones that i've gained over the last four years of doing this or three years or however long it's been. And it's been, Mm. (laughs) I don't know how long I've been here. I'll be here for many more. But I think as I went on through preclinical, I realized the boundary to say, give myself a full weekend off was important. The boundary to say, I'm not going to work past 8 PM. Even if I think it might make me do better on this exam, it's not worth it. And I think those were wonderful or saying, I'm going to work out even if it doesn't sound very fun. Even if it's just 20 minutes, I know it's better for my mental health. And I know that that is something that I need. But ultimately, those boundaries were only possible because the system in place allowed some degree of free time to pursue and as Nathan, those outside activities. And as Nathan suggested, at some point in your yeah in your time in, in medical education, your time does not become your own or becomes not your own. And hopefully that time is, is not forever. Yeah. It's not correct. Right. I mean, as, as I think we mentioned on last week's show, Dean Choi told me that, you know, you can work the hours that you want to work. That's a choice that, you know, once you get past the education, the formal education phase, once you get past residency, you can start to work hours that make sense for you. It's just a matter of deciding, you know, for instance, how much money do I want to make? How, where do I want to go with this career that I have selected? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, do I want to be, do I want to be a top, do I want to be the top surgeon? Do I want to be the dean of the medical school? Do I want to be the, the, you know, chief medical officer? What, you know, or do I want to be, you know, a doctor or, you know, you know that sort of base or, or yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, I, I think, I, I think it's about choosing your barometer for success. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what does success mean for you? I think that, I think that's an important conversation that people have to have with themselves, maybe even before they get here to decide, you know, do I want to do, do I want to push for all honors? 
am I okay with not having everything, not having every class and not getting honors in every class? I have a question that I'd like people to ask themselves then. And ever since I heard this and it's so cheesy and I hate myself for even saying it, but it is a great quote. And I've told a lot of people, but I heard this quote from a woman named Robin Arzone. And she said she uses her no to protect her. Yes. And I know that that's so cheesy mm-hmm. and I am admitting it straight up. I'm going to put that on a, a sign on my wall. Honestly, on you should pillow, because on a a pillow. Pillow. I now ask myself this question with just about every activity, including like if somebody asks me to do something. And the idea of the question is ask yourself, is this activity a hell yes? Is this something that I absolutely want to do? Is this what I want to put my time, my energy, my effort toward? For example, that might be getting high honors that might be becoming the world's best dermatologist plastic surgeon whatever it may be if that's your hell yes do it if it's not it's a no like you gotta say no to a lot more things than you're saying yes to so using that no to protect your yes you have to figure out what that yes is and once you do it's going to be great because then you're going to actually be able to ask is this serving the purpose that i want it to serve in medical school if your goals are to pass your classes and maintain your mental health. If trying to study for three more hours is not going to serve those two purposes, it's a no, close the textbooks, move on. This is an oversimplification. And I know that not every aspect of life can come with these decisions because when you're in surgery and you're doing your clerkship and you don't want to be there, it's not a hell yes, (laughs) but it also can't be a no. But I think controlling the things you can control in life despite the fact that we live in a world where there's a lot of uncontrollables, you will start to reclaim that little bit of energy that you can serve toward other purposes than just the shit you have to do here in medical school. What are your hell yeses? What are my hell yeses? I don't even know yet. I'm trying to figure them out. My hell yeses currently include playing with my dog, hanging out with my husband, only generally working eight hours in the lab. If I like, can do that reading those are kind of the hell yeses at this point sometimes that means when somebody asks me to grab dinner it's a no because i want to read or i want to see my dog or i have an experiment going but a lot of my hell yeses right now are just setting boundaries outside of work i completely agree with that but one really hard thing about setting boundaries and knowing what you want is having time to reflect Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's really hard to set out set time to reflect when like undergrad is specifically designed if i mean if you're like the traditional student undergrad is designed to get you into med school you have to work your butt off to get into med school and then you get to med school and you have to work your butt off just to like get there and then you get like match results and you're like okay so the average person like has these step scores and had this percent honors and like had this many research papers and this many research experiences and this many volunteer and like work experiences and you're like oh shoot so i need to have everything and you're like well you know if half of the people had that much then half of the people did uh, yeah i was gonna say that um, always remember when you look at these statistics they are averages they they mm-hmm. don't they the, the more perhaps the more important is the standard deviation and the spread and all that yeah. kind of stuff. But, <laughs> but it's just that like, stuff is never shared uh for some reasons so. and it's so hard and i know we've talked about it on previous i'm sure way too many times but it's like we look and we're like oh this one of my friends is doing really well in classes. I should be like them. This person is doing really well in research. I should be like them. This person is going to the gym all the time. I should be like them. This person has their, like, at least externally, they have a good mental health. I should be like them. And then you forget that, like, those are all different people Mm -hmm. and not everyone can have everything. And it's like, I talked to my psychiatrist on Wednesday and I like said the good things and I said all the bad things that were like going on in my life. And she was like, you know, you said a lot of good things and you like breezed over them. You just like didn't give them the time of day to even think about. You were just like, here are the bad things. And you're like, you know, you're in med school. You're doing a good job. You're setting boundaries, which like once again, like takes a lot of reflection and a lot of like it takes work to set. It takes boundaries. way more energy than it should. But yeah, it does. It's like the ability to be like, even though I could study more, I need to not takes is takes skill. It takes energy and it takes effort. I found even in like more ways than you'd think just to be like, you know, I need to stop. I know it's going to like stress me out a little bit at the beginning because I know that I could be doing something, but I know that like once I get into the routine, it's like, no, it's 5 p.m. Time to like go home. And so that's something that like 
you know, I have to be told constantly is like, I am doing a good job. And even though like I can like tell you a list of things that I wish I was doing better, that doesn't negate the fact that I'm doing a lot of things well. Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Thank you. So I know a lot of our listeners are pre-meds. A lot of them are trying to like go through the application experience. So I like to focus for a little bit just on like how undergrad, I guess, did well in preparing us for med school and how it could have done a little bit better. So I'll just start by opening up and asking, like, how how does it compare to undergrad and what are things that you did in undergrad that you found successful enough to continue in med school? I would say that it was, like, mostly self-motivated, just kind of looking up on Reddit what I was supposed to do to get into med school and doing those things. I think the studying was definitely so much less, but sometimes the amount of time put in was similar. Instead, it was just... Two hours of volunteering here, two hours of volunteering here, two hours of studying, two hours of working my job, and then getting to hang out with friends or something at the end of the day. But now it's just a different proportion. Now it's more like 80% studying and 20% of, I don't know, whatever people do, like volunteering or research or partying. They're hell yeses. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I feel like looking back at undergrad... I I almost kept none of the things that I was like doing well in undergrad, but I do have advice for that. And it's not that my undergrad didn't prepare me well. It was that the again, the pace at which the information was coming meant that I didn't have to study constantly. It meant that my study strategies were very different. So my biggest piece of advice for people who are coming from undergrad and or really anywhere and coming to medical school is be ready to accept that your study strategy isn't working. So I think there's a lot of pride coming into medical school and feeling like, oh, what I did worked because for most people it did work in undergrad. So the best thing I did was recognize pretty early on what I was doing was absolutely not going to work. Like trying to write notes and do it all on my own. I learned day one, that was not going to work. All right, we got to go to the PowerPoints. I learned very early on that just like going through the slides isn't going to work. We need some degree of active recall. I'm not an Anki person, but I know a lot of people like it. And none of that was stuff that I did in undergrad. It was a complete 180 from undergrad where I was just kind of learning how to do problems and then do them on the exam. So recognizing and being okay with the fact that like your study strategies right now might not be that good and trying a few really quick off the bat because eventually you'll find one that sticks and you'll actually stick with it. Something that I don't think undergrad, this was my mentality in undergrad and it was kind of this time after undergrad where I feel like I had like the space to grow, but I had such horrible routines and habits and just like overall health in undergrad. I would feel like I was so, you know, like as they was saying, like doing so many th- extra things outside of school, whether it's leadership, volunteering, work, research, and then like trying to fit school in that I like wasn't exercising regularly i was eating horribly i was like getting you know i thought it was like cool or fun to like get four to five hours of sleep on the regular and that's not cool and i mean i guess i'd like i thought it was at the time but then like in the space in between undergrad and medical school to have a more like a regimented schedule or a regular schedule which is more similar i think to medical school because so much of your day is like laid out for you i was able to set routines and to set like more healthy habits whether that's and it can be whatever for anybody but i think having that space outside of undergrad to establish things that would like help keep me sane help keep my mental health like afloat and keep my body like functioning was something that like prepared me for medical school so that like when things did get tough i like fell back onto those like more healthy routines as opposed to the garbage ones that i had PSA to undergrads, if your hell yes is getting four to five hours of sleep, (laughs) you might have a problem. It's time to make that one a no. (laughs) Correct. correct. (laughs) So one more question that I feel like needs to be talked about is like, especially for the pancake thing, you're like, okay, so we have say two pancakes. You eat one, 
and you're like, okay, I'm full. I can't have any more. How, how do you do that? I guess like, I'll, I know I'll put exactly it a little bit, what you're saying. If that but like, how do you know when you need to break? How do you know when, even if you didn't get everything you need done during the day, how can you just say, you know, I need to, I need to stop. I need to move on. Tomorrow might be a little bit harder, but right now I need to stop. How do you do that? How do you justify that? And more importantly, how do you manage the rest of the week, the rest of the day, in order to not overwhelm yourself later? This is such a good question. And it goes back to the four to five hours of sleep. So I'm going to bring that back up. A lot of people will say, oh, I want to study all night and I'm going to get four to five hours of sleep and it's going to go great in the morning and I will have spent three more hours studying. So obviously that will show up in my grade percentage or whatever. But I want people who are doing the three hours of sleep or not doing whatever whatever healthy habit it is that you you have defined for yourself as something that you would both enjoy doing and that you think brings yourself health. That looks very different for everyone. Sleep is a good example because generally across the board, it is like recommended for every single person to be getting more than four to five hours of sleep. <clears throat> So ask yourself, how do you feel after four to five hours of sleep? Most people are going to say, I feel like absolute crap. Most people are going to say, I am less of a good person that next day. I cannot study as much as I can when I get four to five hours of sleep. Odds are you can't focus as much when you're on the exam. Like you're not going to be a good person. And a lot of this comes with this time to sit, sit back and reflect and say, in the morning, do I feel good after my night of sleep? Do I feel rested as sleep is supposed to be? If that answer is no, time to think of sleep as like a higher value in your brain. Put it a little bit higher on the hell yes categories. Put four to five hours of sleep a little bit like higher on the hell no categories. And think to yourself, like, and that's what I would do is I'd say, what is going to bring me, what's going to make me a better human tomorrow? Is it studying three more hours tonight? No. Is it getting good sleep? Yes. What's going to make me a better human mentally? Is it doing the 20 minute workout that won't take me that long and takes almost no effort, but it'll at least clear my brain and lower my anxiety? Yes. It is not studying for 20 more minutes and being okay with that like discomfort of knowing that there's always something more to do, but recognizing that getting the rest that you need, getting the refueling that you need is going to make you stronger the next day also isn't this a bit of, isn't this maybe pop psychology but isn't the part of the function of sleep to integrate memories no learn? that's not pops so that's not like pop science psychology. that's literal it reminds me that one of the big problems i think a lot of people suffer from is procrastination and for me the way that i get around or get over a desire to procrastinate on something is realizing that you know i can't predict the future Right. And so if I put this off for tomorrow, because I think I'll have more time tomorrow to do it, there's a chance that something will blow up tomorrow and then I will have zero time. So do it today because, you know, put in the time today because you, I mean, there's no way to, there, the, the future isn't guaranteed for you. Or um, today is the day that disaster is striking and you have tomorrow so maybe today is not the day where you're going to do your very best work i also, also run, run into that one which is like i am not doing so hot today yeah i cannot focus the studying that i'm even going to do is not going to be effective so the better alternative to me sitting here suffering trying to shove this information into my brain is actually taking a nap taking a bath doing whatever wellness thing that i need to do and coming back with a fresh brain tomorrow. Sometimes you got to know when to walk away. So you got to like, you got to have a gauge for, for where you're at. What's your vibe? Do you feel your vibe slipping? Will tomorrow be a worse day? Maybe let's focus on it today. I think it was interesting hearing your front loading analogy because I had been thinking of the pancakes very differently because for my strategy, I feel like I have my musts and then my extras. So every day my musts are watching each lecture and doing my Anki. And that's it. Like, I don't have to do anything else, but I need a certain amount of extras to actually like do well on the exam. So I guess when I was thinking of our two pancakes each day, I was thinking of those as the must. But there's really more like infinity pancakes mm. and you have to choose how many of the pancakes you're putting on extra your you want. Yeah. Correct. So sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, you got to feast a little bit 
sometimes there's a famine <laughs> at the end of the and this is i think what's hard of medical school with the infinite pancake and this is really the crux is like there's an infinite amount of pancakes mm-hmm. there for you if you want it like if you want to sit there and eat yeah. pancakes all day and study all day like nobody's gonna tell you you can't eat that pancake correct <laughs> there's, there's always more to learn that is what i didn't realize when i came in here even the lectures even if i knew the lectures front to back there's like way more information that's not in the lectures that i could learn about those topics yeah mm-hmm. and so that's like and we can't I, we're all kind of like listen to your body. i think the common thing is like listen to yourself like no Nobody can tell you when you're full. Nobody can tell you when you've had enough. Like only, only you can. And it's hard. It's hard to listen to that when you see other people seemingly like push past that. But it, I prom, like I can't promise anything. But I, I am confident that like your ability to listen to yourself and to do what is right for you, like will come with time and experience. And some days you'll learn like, Oh, ate too much pancakes there. Like that's my, you know, that's all my tummy can handle. And th- through this kind of like trial and error experience, I think you'll find, you'll find the the syrup for you. You'll find the sauce. And like, <laughs> yeah. once I'm again, totally, that's... you know how in the beginning of shows lately, I've been saying the fire hose analogy, I'm changing it to pancakes. 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 <laughs> so much more dynamic. We've talked previously, just like how, you know, doing those things, knowing when you need to break, like, you know, eating too many pancakes. I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that in the future. It takes a lot of like reflection mm-hmm. because if you're like, okay, I ate my pancakes, time to go to bed and do it again tomorrow. Like it doesn't give you the time to be like, oh shoot, was that a good amount of pancakes? Could have I put another one on the plate or did I put one too many on the plate? Mm-hmm. Uh, that takes like, like I said earlier, it takes a lot of skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like another thing is like finding like the other things to do. So one thing I've convinced myself to do this semester is to do yoga every night before bed which has been super great but there's definitely nights where i'm like i don't want to like my body hurts or like (laughs) i just want to lay down but i'm like no i told myself i would and one thing that the virtual yoga lady says a lot of days is like (laughs) the hardest part is showing up which i feel like is true in basically everything you do it's like you know going to the gym the hardest part is going to the gym like once you're there you can do it and like even if you like suck you still did it and it's like you know once like i get on the yoga mat it's like even if i don't do great like at least i did it and like the mm-hmm. hardest part was convincing myself to do it what's yoga lady's name her name is adrian <gasps> highly recommended adrian she's so good oh my god she's Who's so this great this is a shout yeah. out to yoga with adrian this is a shout out to yoga with adrian <laughs> she's got free youtube videos and they're incredible they're i would really, really recommend it i i knew it was gonna be adrian was definitely a yoga lady <laughs> so of all the millions of potential online no she's yoga. the best she's the best so shout snaps out for, yoga with adrian. Not, a sponsor. For adrian. not a sponsor not a sponsor <laughs> but if she wants to sponsor us i will take <laughs> I agree with the showing up is the hardest part and sometimes you you just got to do it and again it, it all of we're gonna just like rework our way back to reflection like this whole episode because you're not gonna know that you need or want to show up to that activity unless you've taken the time to reflect and ask yourself what are the things that are valuable in my life and again that looks so different for every single person wellness is not just whatever eating healthy exercising meditating if that is what it is for you then like snaps for that like that's awesome but sometimes it is very different and it means laying in bed and watching netflix and maybe that's not like the hardest activity to get started on but generally like find what that is for you and set a goal and say i'm gonna do this activity and i know that it brings me joy and so even when it's hard you know that you just need to get started and then you're you're in a better spot after, which is probably how you feel is like it might have been hard to start, but I feel exponentially better after. And sometimes that is also what it feels like to stop studying. And kind of on the other side of that, like like you mentioned, like laying in bed watching Netflix or like in my experience playing video games, like a lot of times you're like, oh, I could be doing something more mm-hmm. productive with my time. And so taking that in like a different way of like, no, this is productive. Mm-hmm. This is like like mentally like healthy even if it's not like you know meditation or exercise or one of those things that like instagram people will tell you is good it's like no like playing video games or like laying in bed or just like petting my cat are things that bring me joy and they're things that like make me feel like i didn't just like overwork myself and it's really hard to be like to convince yourself that what you're doing is useful even on paper it isn't but 
in like your heart it's something that like gives you like the energy to do whatever you need to the next day or later that day or whatever thanks thanks for showing up you guys (laughs) thanks that's our show (laughs) even even when it was hard even when it was hard to come to the studio (laughs) even when you wanted to take a nap you showed up yes i appreciate that that's our show like this was a pancake that we ate today it was a pancake it was a bit of a pancake this was a chocolate chip pancake and we found those we found them baby (laughs) we put whipped cream and syrup on it (laughs) <laughs> That's our show. Matt, Zay, Nathan, Riley, thanks for being on the show with me today. Mm-hmm. And uh, what kind of dog shit pancake would I be <laughs> if I didn't thank you, Shortcuts, for making this part of your week? If you're new here and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. This week's producer is Matt Engelkin. Thank you, Matt. Ooh, you're welcome. Uh, oh. And thank you to this week's editor, Alec Hansen, poor Alec, and Angela Mahoney. <laughs> the show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine, student government, and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Fox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use But the bottom line is that, for what it's worth, I see you, I know you're out there, I wish I could do more. Maybe I can, in ways that I don't understand yet or know about, but I see you, and I'm glad you're here, and other people are too. This Short Code Podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.